Let's return to This Week in America. Here's your host, Rick Bratton. Welcome back, everybody. This Week in America, website thisweekinamerica.us. Guest on the program, Carol Ann Conlon, an author and an illustrator. She's one of 13 children, born in Paris, Ontario, Canada, grew up in Brantford, Ontario, home of Wayne Gretzky. Carol Ann is a graduate of Mohawk College, Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, graduated with a certificate in graphic design, received a certificate of appreciation from the College Board of Governors of Honorable Mention in Creative Writing in 1997, the award was for placing second in creative writing for a short story and extraterrestrial's opinion written in March of 97. Some of her writing was published in a yearly publication offered by the staff and students of Mohawk College. Carol Ann has also won several awards for her artwork. And when you see her latest book, a children's book, The Humongous Goober Slick, you will understand why she was awarded for both the writing and her illustration. Carol Ann Conlon with us on This Week in America. Carol Ann, welcome to the program. Pleasure to have you with us today. Hello there. It is really fun reading the book, The Humongous Goober Slick. And this actually is, is a story, and we'll, we'll talk about the story here, but this, this actually is like a slice of your life, right? This is something that, that, that happened to you, triggered this thought that this, this would make a great book, which it has. Talk about how this whole concept came about. Well, it, it came about, well, the, the concept of the book came about from my daycare kids. I had a pug, king pug, who would always try to sneak my coffee. <laughs> so... The phone rang, and I went out, and when I came back, the one little guy screamed, Look at that, Goober Slick! And the other one was saying, It's humongous! So, anyways, the book came about from that. And I wrote the book for my grandchildren. I was, I was just publishing some things that my husband, James, asked me to publish. He passed away about three years ago, and I had to promise I would write my books, do my artwork, and travel. <laughs> anyway... Well, that's so interesting, and he would be very proud of what you've done. The, the book we're talking about is The Humongous Goober Slick, Carol Ann Conlon, our guest on This Week in America. You go to our website, thisweekinamerica.us, and you can link on directly to get information on the book. And uh, Carol Ann is on Facebook at facebook.com slash carolann.conlon, and that's C-O-N-L-I-N. What kind of reaction did you get? You dedicated the, the book lovingly to your grandchildren. You talk about the kids in in daycare as well. What kind of reaction do you get from the books when when the kids can actually see oh, there the there's there's your dog? It. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the kids love it. Um, actually, when I was first writing it, I had a few ideas. I have Nana's Magic Closet and a few others, but when I asked my grandkids which book they thought I should put out, they said, "Oh, definitely the humongous Goober Slick." So they all want copies of it now, and they've all been reading it, and it just seems like a lot of nieces and nephews have got the book, neighbors have got the book. (laughs) It's just gone, it's done quite well for itself. Well, it's very easy to read and beautifully illustrated, and talk about being able to to combine both of those, not only writing and choosing the words, and and, and we'll talk about how you choose the words, because this is not a 500-page novel, but getting the illustrations there, because the illustrations tell a story even if you didn't read the words, you have an idea of what's going on from looking at the illustrations. How did you juggle those two? Well, I, I just, um, I guess when I just come up with the words and then I draw a picture to go with it, to match it, I tried to make it so that younger kids could learn to read. It's a book that I hope that will get kids to read more. Um, I just drew each page piece by piece and put it together. And that's about how it was done. Well, besides being able to read, they'll learn like big words, humongous. I had to go back several times and look to make sure I was spelling it correctly. So this has been a, a learning experience for me, too. The book is The Humongous Goober Slick. In the back of the book, you can actually draw and explain that because it's sort of interactive. And, and it's a story that kids can relate to because they all have I, pets and they all have uh, pets that like get into things from time to time. Talk about the back of the book where you can actually draw a picture or, or color a picture. Well, I, I love art myself and I love getting kids to draw. I find that um, it interests them. If, and I think that in the book, it's the best thing you could do to get them to be interactive with the book. This way they get to draw their own favorite animal. And then on the next page, I have a picture of uh, the grandma pouring tea with the little dog in the corner, Pugsley, just happy and jumping around. 
The book is humongous. Goober Sleck, the author and illustrator, Carol Ann Conlon, with us on the program. Go to our website, thisweekinamerica.us, and uh, link on and get all of that information. When you sit down, you've got this concept for, for writing it. How difficult is it to get the words down where they're understandable, they're quick, so a child can sit down and read them and, and take a message away from the book, maybe without them even knowing they're taking a message away from the book when they're finished reading? How do you, talk about that process of sitting down and, and writing the actual words. Well, what I did is I sat down and I had to write all the words to what actually say what I wanted to say. And then I had to think of a way to put it in a way that would be simple for kids to read yes. and would still keep their attention. There, therefore, some of the words that they learn are ring, slurp, up and down, because in the book it goes, it, sorry, it, it says up and it goes UP, so you read the word up and then it says down and the word goes down. It's a way of getting their attention so that they know what the up and down is. How it, important. It just, it just took a while to come up with some ideas that kids would love and they'd learn. And to see the finished product, what was it like when you're actually holding this very colorful book and it's like, wow, I just did this and it really looks good. What was that feeling like when you saw the finished product? I couldn't believe it. I, <laughs> I thought the book was pretty cool because I, I only um, drew them with, they're just pencil crayon drawings with black, I drew them with black pen and pencil crayon on top, and yet they came out very good. I think the book came out very well. It was it was, it was well, well accepted. <laughs> they did an excellent job with that. And you can find out if you go on and look the book up, uh, of course, you can Google it, the humongous Goober Slick. Go to our website, thisweekinamerica.us, and you can link on to information on the book. And you can also uh, get information by going to Carol Ann's Facebook page, facebook.com slash carolann.conlin, C-O-N-L-I-N, and get, get all of the information there. I mentioned one of 13 children how did you ever find peace and quiet and time to go off and read? I, I'm, I'm gathering <laughs> that you read a lot as a young child and obviously involved in illustrations and drawing at that time. How important was that for you as you were growing up? Actually, I wasn't a great reader. I was a dyslexic. Well, that's interesting. Um, but what I found is um, the very first book I read, which was really quite, quite in-depth, was um, Florence Nightingale. And it was given to us from a lady who lived down the street. And the drawing, I've always drawn, um, the group of seven, A.Y. Jackson, came to the school and told me, I was one of the kids that was always beat up. I don't know how to say it, but I was the bullied one. Anyway, (laughs) A.Y. Jackson came to the school and he saw my artwork. And when he saw one of the pictures, he pointed at it and he said, who did this? And I was actually afraid to stand up and say it was mine. <laughs> I don't know why, but I was. But when I stood up, he he said, just keep drawing. And he signed my paper. A.Y. Jackson is one of the group of Canadian seven artists. And he's probably passed on long by now. But I remember him as a man, white-haired man with beautiful big guys who just he wanted to take us everywhere and show me whatever he could in art and we had a great time with him he was a very he was very inspiring and that's how i became the artist i guess i just kept drawing well that's so interesting because here we are years later you're recalling that almost like it was something that happened to you yesterday and it actually that moment in time years ago what it's safe to say really shaped the rest of your life hasn't it Yes, it has. It has. I remember he took, um, A.Y. took us to um, one of the museums here, and we went as a class, and I was looking at a picture, and it was um, a drawing somebody had done with a little boy's eyes, and I just had to look at the eyes. Anyways, I was busy looking at these eyes, and the class disappeared, and I got into some trouble. But, <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> all I was doing was trying to understand these eyes. And that was, it was A.Y. Jackson who helped us do that. Talk about the significance of art. You mentioned in in dealing with with young children and daycare and and your grandchildren. So often, and it's a battle that we face in the States with shrinking revenue and a focus on science and technology and electronics and mathematics. And so often we see the arts getting cut back. Yet you're thinking, Boy, for so many of us, certainly for you, and I can recall where the arts touched me in my life, 
it's really been a significant part part of, of, of who we are. Does that sadden you when you see maybe the arts are getting a little shortchanged when uh, when we're doling out funds for teaching? It definitely does because um, art is something that anyone can do. And as a child, they need to know that there's something they can do. And it inspires them to keep going. If they're having trouble in math and English, at least they say, I can do this. I can draw. And it, it inspires them. We need music. We need art. We need, um, we need writers. We need, that's a part of our intellect that needs to always be available to all children. You mentioned as a child, you felt that you were bullied. And I, what did the arts do, the, the, the ability that you could go off and read and draw? Did that help you, help you get through that period? Yes, it still does. When my husband passed away, um, he was a first responder. He went into a fire and rescued five men. He was a volunteer first responder. Sorry, he was a volunteer first responder. He went into a fire and rescued five men from a foundry. Um, They thought he was fine, but three years after, he died from the chemicals that he ingested. And I found that before he died, he made me promise I would write my books, and he gave this card to my daughters. And the first book I had published, they passed this card to me, and when I opened it, it was a card that said, To my Annie, stand strong from the man who couldn't be there. And he had a handsome young man give me roses. From then on, I found that I've started doing a lot of artwork because it takes me away from the... I don't know. I miss my husband. I guess everybody would. Yes. Anyone would. We were together since we were 13, married 45 years. But I find that by doing artwork, it takes you away from what's going on. It gives you time to relax, to kind of meditate. And when, you're doing, when I'm doing my artwork, I see things differently. I'm able to think more calmly. And then I come back around, and you have a beautiful piece of work to share with everyone. <laughs> Well, it sounds like he was a wonderful husband, and I'm, I'm sorry to hear the story. He's really inspired you to go on to do what you're doing now, including publishing the humongous Goober Slick. And it's interesting because as you turn to sort of escape and to, and to refocus, it wasn't to a, a, a math question that, that you turned to. It was to the arts that you turned to. I think there's something there we can, we can all learn. The book is The Humongous Goober Slick. Carol Ann Conlon, our guest on the program, the author and the illustrator. You mentioned working on several other projects. What else are you, are you working on? Well, I'm, I also have <laughs> Nana's Magic Closet. That, that has already been copywritten. My husband, when, when he passed away, he knew I had several books that I had copyrights on, but I had never published them. So I started publishing them. But I have Nana's Magic Closet. I have um, one is God is My Witness, Annie's Story by Ann Hayden. It's a pseudonym because I don't want kids to pick up my book. This is a a book more to help others. And then I have, um, I've done a few more, uh, the humongous goober slick. I have, um, let's see, what's the other one? 23rd Psalms, Paintings by Carol Ann Conlon. I have some short stories and poems. I, I have quite a few things out there. Well, you know, I was on the Facebook page, and I saw the Annie book, and it wasn't your name, and I, I was thinking, okay, you're talking about somebody else, but that did that book, was that nominated for an award, did I read? Yes, the book was nominated for the Eric Hoffer Award. Okay, that's what I saw. Congratulations. Um, thank you. I was very honored to have my name put there, especially especially being a dyslexic. It was very cool. Well, you should be uh, very um, excited about that. So you have a number of other projects, and hopefully we can have you back on the program to to talk about those. Through all of this, you're able to reach out and to help other people, whether it's a book geared for adults or this book, which will bring a smile to a child's face and help them as their uh, imagination is growing, learn about the arts. How does that feel to be able, not just to have the book and to feel like, okay, I've accomplished something, but I'm actually touching lives, whether it be a child or whether it be a, 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 a widow somewhere. I think it's cool. I, I think that to be able to help people is, is something we all have to do. We, we all um, we need each other. 
And if you don't share your stories, then other people won't know how to share their story. And once you start to share stories, we can all heal. We can all help each other. It's I would consider it, what would you call it? Um, I wouldn't consider it a hand... Uh, I'm trying to say this. I wouldn't consider it a hand out. I would consider it a hand up. Oh, yes, And exactly. I would hope that if anybody read the book, they would just help someone else. Just do your best to help the people around you. We have to survive in this world, and I think that we need each other. Well, the book is The Humongous Goober Slick. It will bring a smile to your face. This would make a great book to uh, to give to any young people in, uh, in your lives. And uh, uh, the illustrations are excellent. The book is excellent. It's available all across the country, all across the countries. She's calling, we're talking to Carol Ann from Canada, so it's available worldwide. Information at our website, you can link on directly at uh, thisweekinamerica.us. And again, the Facebook page for Carol Ann is facebook.com slash Carol Ann, one word, dot Conlin, C-O-N-L-I-N. Uh, this has to be an exciting time for you. And uh, Pugsley still doing uh, doing okay? <laughs> no, Pugsley has passed away. Oh, I'm now sorry I to hear have... that. I liked him. Yeah, I like him too. Bruce and Maddie. Pugsley I bought from um, Humane Society. They were going to put him to sleep when he Ooh. was two years old, and I just couldn't stand to see anything happen to him, so I brought him home with me. And now I have two more pugs. I have Robert the Bruce and Matilda, who are Bruce and Maddie in my book. <laughs> and, yeah, I think I love the pugs. Yes, and you can see the pictures of all that we talked about at the uh, the back of the book, the humongous goober slick. Uh, Carol Ann, thank you so much for joining. I've got about 30 seconds or so left. I mentioned Brantford, Ontario, and when we talked before, I said, isn't that the hometown of Wayne Gretzky? And you actually were familiar with Wayne Gretzky when, yes. when he grew up in Brantford. Yes, Wayne used to take care of my granddaughter, uh, or my daughter, sorry, my daughter Holly in the nursery at St. Mark's Church. He he was a pretty good kid. Um, yeah, can I say just one more thing? Sure. I, I think that um, I'm hoping to write books that put smiles on people's faces. I think I'd rather see them smiling than sad. Well, yes. And if kids can laugh, that would be cool. <laughs> and the book will do that, and it's relatable because it's you know, like, yeah, our dog would be doing that, or uh, you know, our neighbor's dog yeah. would be doing that. So it's certainly uh, relatable. The book, again, is the Humongous Goober Slick. Humongous, in case you can't spell it, I didn't the first time, H-U-M-O-N-G-O-U-S. So it's an education for all of us, the Humongous Goober Slick. Carol Ann Conlin has been our guest on the program, and you'll get all the information available at our website, thisweekinamerica.us. Carol Ann, congratulations on really a, a, an excellent book that's going to touch a, a lot of children worldwide. Thank you for being with us on the program. Thank you very much. I'm very honored to have been here. It is our pleasure. Once again, the humongous Goober Slick, the book, Carol Ann Conlon, our guest. You're listening to This Week in America. All the information available at our website, thisweekinamerica.us. Welcome back, everybody. This Week in America. Great to have you with us on the program today. Website, of course, thisweekinamerica.us. Our guest on today's show is Dr. Roberta Silfen. She's been a student, teacher, counselor, educational administrator, a graduate student in Cambridge, England, Hawaii, where she received her master's degree in education, Alabama, receiving a master's in counseling, and Texas, where Dr. Silfen obtained master's and doctorate degrees in administration and management. A Fulbright scholar, she's traveled extensively. She's the author of Southern Exposé, the story of her early teaching days in the early 1970s in the Deep South, a white teacher teaching in an all-black elementary school. And Dr. Roberta Silfen with us on This Week in America. Dr. Silfen, welcome to the program. It's great to have you with us on the show. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to be here. It is a fascinating book, and I know this is a book that you, you spent a lot of time thinking about, whether you should write the book or not. Why did you decide to write the book? And it's sort of interesting. I guess some of your students at university actually encourage you to go ahead and write this. Why did you feel the time was right now to write the book? Well, I never wrote it when I finished teaching in the elementary schools because I thought, well, at the time I would never get another job teaching in a public school because uh, it's really an indictment of a public school system. Well, I yes, you lay, you lay it all out there, and I can understand that. So there was this trepidation that if I do this, I, I, I probably am not going to be able to continue doing this. 
let's talk a little bit about that that time frame. It's the early 1970s. For some of us, even at my age, it doesn't seem that long ago, and it's hard to believe things were uh, as segregated as they were at that time. Talk about when you went to, to Montgomery, Alabama, the layout of the community really put you in this position that you were teaching in the, at the all-black elementary school. Yes, well, when I went to look for a job, actually, when I got there, I saw a number of signs in front of houses that said for sale, and I was surprised. And a friend of mine there who happened to be in the real estate business told me that every time they uh, designate a neighborhood as being going to a black school, all the people there moved. In fact, there was one neighborhood that was brand new that was that all black people lived in that neighborhood too and I asked how did that happen and they told me that they built that neighborhood for white people but the white people wouldn't move when it was zoned for the black school so the black people moved in and of course they benefited from that because they lived in nice new homes but uh, that's that's how the schools were set up in those days they were not segregated per se but they were segregated because only black people went there and white people would not go there. They moved from those zones. Before we talk about the experience there at the sixth grade at Carver Elementary School in Montgomery, let's go back to Hawaii. This is where you did your, your student teaching. You did practice teaching there. That's where you got the fundamentals of teaching. Talk a little bit about that and then we'll move it to Montgomery and your experiences there. I understand when you were in Hawaii, it basically was practice time. You were turned loose by yourself on, on a classroom, and you really learned sort of, sort of trial and error how to go about uh, teaching the right way. I did. Well, I went to school at the University of Hawaii. That's where I got my education degree. And then I practiced taught in the school, and in Hawaii you do it for a full semester. And you have a practice teacher there, but in other words, from the first day the class becomes yours. And if you... You do your own lesson plans every day you meet with the teacher and you go over what you tell the teacher what you did and they give you some advice and if you make a mistake all the teacher said to me I had trouble one day and my class was going downhill and hitting rock bottom and she said to me what are you going to do about it I had to come up with my own solution and I went home and I came up with my own solution and from that day it changed and I had a marvelous teaching experience there and the classes had 40 students in them, which was not a problem. I know today they think if they have more than 20 that it's terrible. And then I got a job teaching in one of the schools. It was sixth grade and I taught there for, for two years. And after two years, I left. The school, except for a beginning teacher, was wonderful because they had a beginning teacher supervisor who would meet with you every day and ask you how things were going, would come into the classroom and observe you, and you'd meet with her at the end of every day. And you had all the support you needed, and everything was positive with a smile on her face. So those were very good. There was very good, substantial background that I got in teaching. And I felt that I had learned more in Hawaii than most other teachers learn in other places. You're listening to This Week in America. Dr. Roberta Silfen is with us on today's program. We're talking about her new book, Southern Exposé. Let's go ahead to Montgomery. Well, you actually left Hawaii and ended up in Montgomery, and your husband, an Air Force officer, so being transient was something that was part of your life, wasn't it? That's right. It was part of my children's life also, because I had two young sons, and we always, we always enjoyed going to new places, and I found out that moving for children is dependent upon the parents' attitude. So my children was always, were always excited to go to new places. And you go to Montgomery, Alabama, and you apply for a teaching job, and you find out that you will, and knew that you were going to be teaching at, at what ends up being an all-black school. Talk about that experience. Talk about how you were treated by the students. In the book, Southern Expose, you do an excellent job of, uh, of outlining the students and how you adapted to them. They adapted to you. Talk about how you were greeted, like that first day of school when you go to sixth grade at Carver Elementary School. What was that experience like? Well, first they sort of, they try and size you up. Oh, yes. And, of course, and since they were all black and I was white, I don't know if I was the first white teacher they ever had. But I had little problems with discipline and they didn't want to listen to me and they didn't want to do any work. And when I'd give them uh, assignments, they never completed them. So I decided I had to do something about that. 
And so I started putting games in the back of the room. And I told the students when they finished their assignment, they could go play a game in the back of the room. After about a week or so, one of them finally finished. And I said to him, okay, now you can go in the back of the room and play a game. He said to me, really? Because he didn't believe me. I said, yes. After that, the students used to complete their assignments. I made them longer and longer. They completed their assignments, and they, and they went back in the room and played. So they were learning at the same time. They talked about discipline problems. Did you have discipline problems when you took over the classroom? At the beginning, I did. And a couple of the black teachers told me, oh, uh, I'm very strict with them. And uh, I tell them if they pay, I tell the parents when they come and complain, if they go to the Board of Education, when they come out, you're going to need a dustpan and a broom to pick up the pieces. And she said they never complained to me. Another teacher said, oh, she bangs their head against the chalkboard. And then they never complain. So we, the couple of new white teachers and I had a meeting with the principal. And we told her what those teachers had said. And she said, that's not true. She said, you look in the mirror and say the most terrible things and look at the look on your face. And that's the look you give to the children. But I never had to do that. Because I always believed them and I always trusted them and respected them. And in return, they trusted me and respected me. And we never had a problem. It's interesting. When you found out that you could actually wear pants into the classroom, uh, classroom rather than a dress, that actually helped the, uh, the discipline problem, didn't it? I guess there's something about respect when you're actually wearing pants in the front of the class. I guess that's true. <laughs> I found it did make a difference. So after that, I wore pants every day. When I first came there, it was not allowed. During the time that I was there, they changed the rulings. And it's interesting because you're there and it's not all that long when the kids really enjoy having you. They're learning and they're actually asking, you have some time on the weekend. Let's get together and do this again on the weekend. They wanted to make the, the school into six days a week, didn't they? Yes, they did. First of all, uh, after we, I started letting them play games, they had told me they liked to listen to music. And one brought a radio to school. And I said, "If I will let you listen to the music if you promise to do your work. They said yes, and so we used to play music, and the children did their work, and at the end of the day, I used to dance with them at the end of the day. We had a good time. I really enjoyed them very much. They were wonderful children. They were very open and honest and trusting, and I was with them too, and I, I became part of the class. There were no leaders in the classroom. There were no followers in the classroom. Uh, it was just a group, in a group of unique individuals, and they accepted me as one of them. Dr. Roberta Silfen is our guest on This Week in America. Her book is Southern Exposé. It's available all across the country. You go to Amazon, you go to Book Venture, and you can get information on the book. You can only kind of directly by going to our website, thisweekinamerica.us. Uh, it's interesting. You would like to think that everyone had equal access to, to education at that time. But that really wasn't the case, was it? You, you really were at sort of a, of a disadvantage. For example, with school books, you had no library. You had textbooks that, that were hand-me-downs. It was sort of difficult, wasn't it, uh, at, at that time? Yes, but this was a learning experience for me. I had no idea. They used to send a bookmobile to the school, and I'd send a child down to pick, pick out books. The principal would say, the bookmobile is here. I, she said, send two children down. The children would come up with these old books that were not even for children. So I decided my children didn't know how to pick books. The next time the bookmobile came, I would go down because I had two children in another school and they used to come home with delightful books from the bookmobile. The next time the principal said, the bookmobile is here, I went down. And I saw these old torn books and they were not children's books. And there was an old man who was the driver of the mobile. Maybe he was a librarian also. And I said to him, these are not books for children. And he said, these children can't read anyway. I said, they most certainly can. And I stormed out. And then I wrote a letter to the Board of Education complaining about him and the books. We never had another bookmobile. And then the principal said to me, we're not going to have any books. I went down to the main public library. And I made arrangements for each teacher to come down once a month. They could check out 30 books and bring them back to the school. And every 30 days we would change them. And we had our own library. It's interesting. You created your own library. 
Uh, right. Field trips, something else that these students were at a disadvantage because with field trips, they needed to have some funds to be able to, to get the transportation, that type of thing. Not able to do that. And you were able to solve that problem as well uh, using the police department. Yes, well, they had the symphony was free for children to go, but yeah. we had no transportation. And so somebody told me they thought the police department would do that. So I called the police department and they said, yes, they would provide us with a bus. I had to tell them how many children and when. Before we left, I admit I had to talk with the students. And I told them, we're going to the symphony tomorrow. I want you to dress well. And a lot of people here think that black children do know how to behave. So I want you to be on your best behavior. And they said, okay. Next day we got went. We got on the bus, we went to the symphony, they walked very orderly, they sat in their seats quietly, they listened to the music, they clapped appropriately, and when it was over, we got up and we left, and they went back on the bus. They were so well behaved, better than any of the other students there in the school. And of course, I commented, I told the children when we got back, I told them they were marvelous and they just beamed. And after that, we used to go to every symphony, and the police always provided the bus for the transportation, and the children were always better behaved than any other students at the symphony. And with textbooks, it's interesting because when you thought you were going to get new textbooks, they actually were just newer textbooks from the white schools. Their textbooks have been replaced. Their old textbooks you got. And you talk about one of uh, the Nova students that, uh, that had an interesting take on all of that. Yes, I have a Nova student now who... When, after the book was published, I sent her a copy, and she sent me an email. She said, I remember those days, she said, because I was given a book that had no cover and it had no back, and it had torn pages inside. So she had, she had books that were even worse than the ones my students got. The book we're talking about is Southern Exposé. Our guest on the program is Dr. Roberta Silfen. She's talking about the... Uh, the, the time she spent a white teacher in an all-black school in Montgomery, Alabama. Do children see racial differences? And, and you talk about that in the book, and the, the, the question that's asked of you during class, what color is Jesus? How, how did you handle situations like that? Well, when, when I used to have class discussions, groups, I used to sit in one of the chairs, the student chairs with them, and we would talk. And some boy came in, and he looked around the room, and he left, another student. And I found out from that teacher that he came to speak to the teacher in my classroom. And he went back and told her the teacher isn't in that room. He didn't even see a difference. And one day in one of the books that we were reading, we got into a discussion about Jesus. And they said to me, what color is he? I said, I don't know. So I said, ask the principal to please come up here. She was black. And she came up and I said, the students have this question. What color is Jesus? Can you answer them? And she thought for a minute, and she said, no, I can't answer that question either. So she left, and at a later point, I told the children, I think that artists paint pictures of people that reflect them. So that a white artist probably paints Jesus as, as white, and a black artist probably paints Jesus as black. One of the aspects you touch on is the importance you place on the teacher-learner relationship. Talk a little bit about that because it was really your philosophy going into the classroom and in a very short period of time, you were able to, to, to win over the students and it was a productive, a productive experience for both you and the students. Talk about that relationship. Okay, first of all, I don't believe that you can teach children all you want, but if they don't want to learn, they're not going to learn from right. you. And I started off with... Uh, Teaching black, I started teaching black history. One of the black teachers told me that none of them can teach it and these children don't know it. So I had to educate myself and I educated myself on the early African societies and I started from the very beginning with the children. And then we got to the point where uh, of the sit-ins in the south when uh, black people wouldn't be served the soda fountains and things like that. And I explained the sit-ins to them. Well, our principal used to say, I say the children learn when they can apply, you can tell when they apply their learning, you know they've learned something. Well, the principal in the school used to sell juice every day to, in the afternoons <laughs> to the children, and the children always bought the juice. They paid for it. And one day, the principal had a ruling that they also used to serve for lunch nuts and fruits and things like that, and the children used to save those cups to have with their juice. Well, I think the principal had other things she wanted to sell to the children, so she made a ruling that they could not 
save their nuts and fruits for juice time. They had to finish it at lunch. So when the children heard that, they said, we're having a sit-in. We're not buying her juice. Now, I never said anything. I just let them, I didn't say yes and I didn't say no. I just let it ride. And the next time somebody came up for them to buy juice and to give their money, they just said, we're not buying juice. And this went on for about two weeks. And finally, the principal came into the room and said to them, how come you children are not buying my juice? And they just, one of them just stood up and told her, you are not letting us eat our, our nuts and our, our, our fruit, so we are not buying your juice. So a little while later, she rescinded the ruling, and then they started <laughs> buying the juice again. At another time, the children used to go down to the cafeteria for lunch every day. I never bought lunch. I, my whole teaching career, I always brought my lunch with me. And they get online, and they come back with, say, for if they serve spare ribs, they get one rib with no meat on it, just a knob of fat on the end. And I felt this was not enough for the children. So I used to send them back for a second time on the line. Now, the teachers got big portions, but the students got almost no protein whatsoever. And the woman who was on the lunch line never complained because she agreed with me. She said, I know what you're doing because I know they need more food. Well, one day they served chicken, and one of the children in the class said, oh, that means we're going to have chicken again tonight. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, because the people take the food home from the cafeteria and they sell it in the neighborhood. I said, oh. The next day I came to school with my camera, and as I went to one of the windows that you could watch the parking lot, and I saw the people leaving the, ca the cafeteria, the workers, with these big trays of, of food on top of them. It was this chicken piled high, wasn't even covered. I said, oh. So I took pictures. I was called down to the principal's office, and she said to me, what are you going to do with those pictures? It's amazing how she knew everything that was going on. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I said, I hadn't decided what I was going to do with the pictures. We had our own PE. And we took care of it ourselves. So the next day at physical education, I took all my children outside before the cafeteria workers left, and they were playing ball, and all of a sudden they saw the cafeteria workers walk out to the, go to their cars, and one of them yelled, that's our food, and they all ran after them. And of course, I didn't say anything, but the people, ran, cafeteria workers ran back in the building. <laughs> Just one of the many great stories in the book, Southern Exposé, our guest on the program, rapidly running out of time, is uh, uh, Dr. Roberta Silfen, that's S-I-L-F-E-N. The book's available all across the country. It's an excellent read about uh, what life was like in the early 1970s. And you say this, and I can tell in, in listening to your voice now, it's almost like this was yesterday when you, when you had these experiences. You call them some of the most satisfying and enjoyable experiences of your career. In fact, I understand what at the end of uh, the second or third year there, they said, okay, basically, congratulations, you can now move on to a white school. And you said, no, thank you. I said, I liked it there, and I wanted to say that I loved those children. They were wonderful. And it was such a pleasure to see them grow and be ed become educated and wanting to learn because I made it fun for them. At the beginning, I used to have to make everything into a game for them to learn, but they learned. In fact, uh, when I got there, I couldn't understand their speech because uh, they dropped the, the endings of every word. And I had one boy who used to translate for me. Well, their speech changed while I was there because they started to emulate mine. I even had somebody come from the district office and poked her head in the room and she said, my goodness, they're even using dictionaries. These children learned and they became edu I know one of the girls got a scholarship and went to co on to college and she got a tennis scholarship because I started them playing tennis on the blacktop out there. And what, if I recall, you didn't have any nets, you just had... I went to a, a, to a uh, couple of garage sales and I bought some tennis rackets and some balls and we played without nets, but they learned. That's amazing. And what's it like when you look back on that part of your career? How, how rewarding is that? Because you went in with nothing and you gave these kids hope, you gave them opportunity, you gave them an opportunity to thrive in a classroom that really wasn't designed for them to thrive in. Well, it makes me feel good. It makes me feel like I was so successful that uh, it was the most successful years of my life. And you've had a lot of success in your life. 
starting with the Fulbright Scholarship and uh, teaching and traveling all around the world. The book is Southern Exposé by Dr. Roberta Silfen. That's S-I-L-F-E-N. The book's available all across the country. Uh, Dr. Silfen, thank you so much for joining us on the program. I really enjoyed reading the book. Uh, What a career and what an influence you had on a number of children back in that time frame. Thank you for sharing the stories with us on the program today. You're welcome, and thank you. I've enjoyed talking about it. It was great having you with us on the program. And the book, once again, is Southern Exposé by Dr. Roberta Selfin. You can find information, of course, available at our website, thisweekinamerica.us. Welcome back, everybody, This Week in America. Great to have you with us on the program today. Our website is thisweekinamerica.us. Dr. Johanna Mosca is an accomplished writer, yoga master, and teacher of teachers. She has extensive background in education, human resource development, and public speaking. Her first career consisted of 25 years as a high school English teacher, staff developer, graduate writing instructor, and educational consultant, earning her Ph.D. in writing research and theory from New York University. Johanna has also passed two licenses to become a New York City high school principal, Her passion is to share through her writing the ancient wisdom of Patanjali Yoga Sutras, helping people live in greater peace, harmony, and integrity. She's written three books, Yoga Life, Ten Steps to Freedom, and Cultivate Contentment Using Ancient Wisdom to Thrive in Today's World, and her latest that we'll be talking about on today's program, Teen Triumph, Ten Ways to a Winning Life, Bringing This Ancient Wisdom to Teenagers. Dr. Johanna Mosca with us on This Week in America. Welcome to the program. It's great to have you with us. Thank you, Rick. It is such an interesting book you've got, and it is so helpful. I'm an adult. I'm not a teen anymore. I'm not even close to being a teen, and I'm reading this going, okay, I'm taking something away from this. This all started for you, this yoga and and being able to reach out and help people with a, a vacation in Sedona, Arizona. Talk about that, because that really was life altering for you. Well, I went to Sedona. And its mystical, magical red rocks drew me in. And I camped outside, kind of evading the forest rangers for a while, (laughs) and did yoga on the red rocks. And then I decided what I wanted to do was move there. And my passion was to lead yoga and hiking on the red rocks. And you started doing that, and, and life really changed for you. And you've been able to help so many people what is that life like when you see this transformational change in people? Like, like you saw in yourself when you, you were introduced to Sedona and the Red Rock and to yoga. Well, I have a slogan for it. I call it Become More of Yourself in Sedona. Um, it's about if we can clear our minds and the chatter and the self-recrimination that's part of being human, there's so much magnificence to appreciate and feel and uh, the vortex is health in Sedona, and also, uh, you know, the piece of yoga. So it's really about clearing yourself so that more of yourself can come through. You're listening to This Week in America. Dr. Johanna uh, Mosca is our guest on the program today. Uh, the book is called Teen Triumph. Her website is very simple, yogalife.net. Inf- interesting information there from Dr. Mosca, as well as information, of course, on the book. And you can link on directly by going to our website, thisweekinamerica.us, and go directly to Dr. Mosca's uh, website and get information on the book. I mentioned the background that you had in, in education. The book is Teen Triumph, or you've decided to devote this book to, to empowering teenagers. Talk about the importance of that and why you decided, I, I really need a book because I think I can write this book, because I can go back and and I can really make some changes in the lives. Boy, you talk about conflicted time in life. That's certainly what you go through as a teenager. You know, I look at the, the statistics on teen problems, and they're, they're astronomical. I think I first decided I wanted to write about the yoga for teens when there was that Columbine school massacre. I, I just saw it on television. They're killing each other. You know, there's so many statistics on violence and school shootings, and the the third highest thing killing teenagers is suicide. They they say that one out of three students has been bullied in school. There's excessive drinking, drug use, et cetera, et cetera. And 
it's just such a hard time. It's almost like they're little puppets, and everything's pulling at them. Uh, you know, the parents one way, siblings another, yes. the peers in school that they want to pr- please, and their teachers. And the whole purpose of the book, Teen Triumph, is to get to have a little strength in yourself so you can cut some of these strings that are pulling on you. The book is Teen Triumph. Yeah. It's available at Dr. Mosca's website, which is yogalife.net. And the wisdom that you share, it's not something that all of a sudden you thought of or it's from a decade or two ago. We're really going back a a long time in history, aren't we? And and lessons that were valuable then and are valuable today. Yes, Rick. The the Yoga Sutras or uh, wise sayings of Patanjali, 196 sutras about how to live life for peace and harmony and well-being, they date... People aren't sure of the exact date, but some date them 2,000 years before Christ. And they've been used in every culture, every religion. And my challenge was to make them fun and give teen examples and illustrations so that children would be able to get understand them and live them and make smart choices from them. In the book Teen Triumphs, you talk a lot about the, the importance of inner strength. Talk a little bit about that. In fact, you said accessing your inner strength is like becoming your own best friend. Talk about the importance of that. Well, how do I explain it? I I say to the teens, sometimes in life you felt you weren't supposed to do something, but you did it. But a part of you knew there is a part of you that is your awareness. I call it your inner awareness. If you think about it, you, Rick, me, every person watches what passes through us, the thoughts, the feelings, the emotions, the opinions, the judgments. There's a part of us that watches everything go through us. And that is the part that I call your watcher, your witness, your inner awareness, that if when you're feeling jarred or feeling crummy or feeling upset or angry, you're able to stop. That's the most important thing, to say, stop. This is not who I am. I can go inside myself and shift and find some greater strength. It's almost like I wish I could wave up a, a, a red stop sign that says, stop and shift. With us on This Week in America. Yeah, it, that's so important. And you do such an excellent job in the book of of laying that out in words that uh, that everyone can understand. In fact, that's something that uh, one of the reasons I believe the book is so is so popular and so successful is you really don't talk down to teenagers, do you? You talk at, at their language level with respect and, and they're able to walk away from reading the book with something that's going to benefit their lives dramatically. Thank you for saying that. One, one student, when I was getting teen feedback said to me, I don't want anybody telling me how to live my life. <laughs> yes. And I said to him, I'm not telling anybody, I'm not telling you how to live your life. I'm inviting you to go inside and find out. Well, and you talk about principles, uh, principles that uh, the ancient yoga principles we were talking about, uh, and you, you recommend these. Talk about some of the, the important principles that uh, that you feel it's important for children to be, for teenagers to understand? There are five principles for uh, social harmony with others, for getting along well in life, and five principles for being the best person you can be. These are the first two limbs of the eight limbs of yoga. They're the foundation. And the first ultimate umbrella, foremost, is be kind to one another, be kind to yourself, do no harm. And that's followed with being truthful, respecting what belongs to others, manage your energy, let go of energy drains, be moderate, and let go of attachment. Those would be the social harmony principles. And then there are five principles for making yourself the best person you can be. And the first one is cleanliness or purity, keeping your life clean, your mind clean. And the next one is an important one, cultivate contentment. Don't be a complainer. If things aren't working, look at what doesn't work, tell the truth about it, plant some seeds for something better. Develop discipline, study yourself, and finally, 
surrender it all to a higher power because you really don't have control over everything. You take the best steps you can, and then you know you need to surrender. The book has illustrations. It is a an upbeat voice uh, reviewing every principle that, that we were talking about there. The book is called Teen Triumph, 10 Ways to a Winning Life. The author is Dr. Johanna Mosca. That's M-O-S-C-A. Her website is yogalife.net. You can link on directly by going to our website, thisweekinamerica.us. You talk in the book about monkey minds. Explain, that's an interesting concept. Talk, talk about that. That's an ancient uh, concept in yoga. They call the frenetic fluctuations, ramblings of the mind, your monkey mind, as opposed to when you're calmer, and you're witnessing life, and you're coming from a place of core consciousness or, or, or inner strength. And it's the part of you that is always blaming and criticizing and judging and making things wrong and feeling separation and um, not liking and having grievances and problems. Whereas your core, the witness part of yourself, is your higher self, the monkey's your ego. And the core is inward-looking. It uh, sees connectedness, community, oneness, cooperates. It's filled with harmony, uh, witnesses with detachment, and it allows and forgives rather than blaming and judging and criticizing. And, you know, your, your core essence, your backdrop from which you perceive life, that everything comes through you. One day you're sad, one day you're happy, but there's a backdrop part of you that's your core, that's your higher essence, your strength, um, and it's the opposite of the monkey. So in one of my books, Cultivate Contentment, I have a chart contrasting your, your monkey mind and your core essence. This is all in the book Teen Triumph. With In talking about the monkey mind, you talk about sometimes we have to bite the bullet find a way to, to leave the scene. How difficult is that for teenagers in particular to learn that? You're maybe a little combative at the time and, and, and rather than engaging in something. It's sometimes better just to turn around and, and walk away from that situation. Yes, if you see yourself getting hooked, it's like you have that hook in your mouth yes. and it's pulling you just to say, my piece is more important than this. If I walk away, I can come back stronger and win. The, Whereas if I get hooked now and I'm reactive and I'm in a weak place, it's not going to work. Let me get out of here, recoup myself, get out of my inner strength, and see what my strategy would be. My peace is more important than this. In the book, Team Triumph, we've talked about inner strength, and you've got seven strengtheners that you, you talk about in the book. And these are, are so helpful for not only teenagers, but for all of us. And, and just several, looking through them, quickly release negativity. It's really important and crucial, isn't it? It's so difficult for us because if it's negative, for some reason, that lasts a long time with many of us. It'll last longer than positive, positive thinking. Well, think about the high suicide rate. Somebody who is contemplating suicide has latched on to some negative thoughts. Life isn't working for me. They don't love me. They're mean to me. I want out of here. Whatever it is, the negative thoughts have been magnified, 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 magnified. And the whole of quantum physics is what you think is what you get. So it's, it's gigantic negative, re quickly release negative thoughts. As I was doing the book, the seven of them just came up, because remember to be grateful, think positive thoughts, quickly release negative, questioning your own perceptions. Sometimes they're wrong, and it's not that people don't like them. There's a whole host of reasons. Practice forgiveness, contribute good energy, and most important, like yourself every day. There's such a high incidence of teen-inflicted self-injury inflicting self-injury, liking yourself. Dr. Johanna Mosca is our guest on This Week in America. The book is called Teen Triumph. The website is yogalife.net. Dr. Mosca's last name is spelled M-O-S-C-A. Information, of course, by going directly to our website, which is uh, thisweekinamerica.us, and you can link on directly and get that information. I mentioned the response it has really been excellent. Talk about what that's like like as someone who's a teacher and an educator, 
when you actually see almost the light bulb going off as, as you're talking to young people and you get, uh, you get correspondence back from them after reading the book, it has to be really rewarding to see that you're giving them some really wisdom they need to get through some very tough years of their lives. It's wonderful. It's very, very heartwarming. And the book is called Teen Triumph. A couple of minutes left in the program. Uh, I mentioned that this is something that uh, that ad adults can use as well in going through. It, 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 it's things that we take for granted in going through life. I, you've got reflection on, on the questions that you talk about in the book. It, you sort of uh, summarize and, and go back and, and, and what people are to, to take away from this. In fact, what are the, some of the takeaways that, that you would like to have young readers take away from reading Teen Triumph? Well, first, I would like them to know that they're not the only ones to experience the day-to-day -day ups and downs of being human. Uh, of course, I'd love to have them focus on living the Ten Principles, but if they at least adopted the first one, be kind to one another, be kind to yourself, do no harm. And I would hope that they could increase self-concept and learn to like themselves more. I have a mirror, mirror exercise after each chapter in which they say supportive things to themselves about following that particular principle. I would love them to learn to stop and recognize when they see that they're experiencing some kind of negative energy. Perhaps the stop and shift sign I told you about, they could make one and use it in life. And I'd love to have them practice the seven strengtheners, remember to stay grateful, to like themselves every day. And I just hope that they find something in the book that makes them feel empowered and that makes writing it so worthwhile to me. Well, it is an excellent book. It's called Teen Triumph, 10 Ways to a Winning Life. Our guest on the program has been Dr. Johanna Mosca, M-O-S-C-A. The book is available all across the country, and you can buy the book directly, get information on it, and a whole lot of uh, other information at uh, Dr. Mosca's website, which is yogalife.net. And, of course, you can link on directly to the website by going to our website, thisweekinamerica.us. Dr. Mosca, it's been a pleasure having you on the program. Excellent job with the book. Thank you for sharing it with us on the program. Thank you for this wonderful interview. Lots of love. Thank you. And once again, the book is called Teen Triumph. It's available at the website yogalife.net. And of course, information available at our website, thisweekinamerica.us. This Week in America is online. You can visit our website, thisweekinamerica.us. Scott Pinkerton, associate producer of This Week in America. Jay Anderson, segment producer. Ben Watson, webmaster. Otto Bache, director of engineering and TV production. This Week in America produced and is a trademark of Blue Funk Broadcasting, LLC. For information on all of our guests and to listen to this week's show, our website again at thisweekinamerica.us. And I'm Sean Bratton, executive producer of This Week in America.